produces these so tight that you couldn't do something with a flax seed in a 10-pound mall. You know, and I only see the women laughing. Apparently, they're the ones who know the joke, you know. But that's Dana Marshall. Uh, Dana Marshall is the Vice President of Finance for I.S. Joseph Company. At this time, Dana, I'd like to turn it over and uh, have you with your part of the program. As I walked out the door this morning, my wife asked me if I left the checkbook. So I think you know where the real uh, power lies in this country. <laughs> the day that representatives from the National Farmers Organization first came into the offices of I.S. Joseph Company for the purpose of exporting sunflower seeds, it seems as if it was only yesterday. In fact, it was almost eight years ago. As you are aware, the growth of the sunflower seed industry and the export trade has been dramatic. Our company's president, Burton Joseph, was quick to grasp the concept of the sunflower seed as the coming oil seed. The high percentage of oil content plus the properties of the oil indicate that it was indeed a quality oil with potential for furnishing a great portion of the supply of the world. The inevitability of the development of a sunflower seed processing industry in the United States has come to a point of realization. The I.S. Joseph Company and the National Farmers Organization bring to bear resources on such a sunflower seed crushing plant in the United States. And we are pleased to have joining with us the state group from Argentina. I.S. Joseph Company has been acquainted with the state group for a number of years. Some years back, we shared the same agent in the Netherlands for sale of products in Europe. The CETRO is headquartered in Buenos Aires, Argentina. They have interests in a number of agricultural processing areas. They handle and produce consumer food products and are involved in a number of financial institutions. Most importantly, they have considerable experience in oilseed crushing, and particularly important to us is that they crush sunflower seed in Argentina. I'd like to emphasize here that they will be taking an active role in this project. They will not come in strictly as an absentee investor. We've had a number of their engineers and other experts in our offices working on this project. The 1970s have really been the decade where commodity markets have become internationalized. International integration of marketing has been necessary to realize the full potential of the agricultural crop. The presence of the state group from Argentina provides NFO with an entree for coordination of international markets for sunflowers and their end products. We do believe that the presence of a diversity of firms precludes control of the processing industry by only a few of the largest existing firms. For these reasons, we believe that Susetru brings many advantages to this project. We have with us today representative of the Susetru firm, Mr. Jonathan Green. Jonathan joined Susetru this past summer following a career in banking with a considerable portion of it being internationally oriented. He's based in New York, where he lives with his wife and two children. Jonathan has been educated from one end of the country to the other. He went to Bowdoin College in Maine and then received uh, master's degrees from both the uh, University of California and Stanford in the state of California. So he's uh, been around quite a bit. His uh, banking experience started with Morgan Guarantee Trust. He was with them for six years of which two were in Argentina. And that's where he first became acquainted with Susetru. 
Following his experience with Morgan Guarantee, he was with Bankers Trust for four years, and then with International Marine Banking Company Limited in London for four years. Most recently, he was with Marine Midland Bank before joining Sasetru. With Sasetru, he has a number of functions. He is the representative in the United States for Sasetru's banking and financial interests. He serves as an advisor to Sasetru on investment and financing of various projects and programs, whether they be in the United States or internationally. Jonathan will be working closely with this project, as will a number of other people from Sasetru. Jonathan's involvement with Argentina doesn't end strictly with Sasetru, as he is also a director and Vice President of the Argentine Chamber of Commerce in the United States. We are pleased to have with us today Jonathan Green, who will speak with us concerning the activities of Sasetru, the background of that firm, and their programs. Jonathan? Thank you for that introduction. Uh, initially, let me say that I really am delighted to be with you all today, uh, and I'm particularly thankful to you, Shelley, for the invitation. I have spent uh, times on the East Coast and the West Coast, but I haven't spent much time, as much time as I would like in the Midwest, so I'm fascinated to be the Sasetru representative, uh, representative following this particular project. I think at the outset I should mention that there has been a long and close relationship uh, between Sasetru and the I.S. Joseph Company, perhaps longer than it has been between the National Farm Organization and I.S. Joseph Company. Uh, we have worked together on and off for a period of 15 years, and as an example of the closeness of how, uh, how closely we associate with one another, Burton Joseph today is discussing this Sunflower Crush project in Argentina with the Board of Directors of Sasetru, and Sasetru's principal engineer is today in Minneapolis talking over some of the technical ramifications, which we'll touch on a little bit later, of this crush process. It is true that Sasetru has been invited into this project because of their technology, and we will not be a passive partner in the association. Uh, through the uh, I.S. Joseph Company relationship, we are also well aware of the strength and the potential of the National Farm Organization in the United States. Um, we uh, have been in sunflower oil and uh, sunflower oil production growing and crushing for more than 25 years. We know the industry very, very well. Uh, Argentina has fallen in second place uh, to, the Ar uh, to the United States. The United States now leads Argentina as of last year in terms of production, but for, for the last 20 years we have been the number two producer in the world after Russia. We do know the industry very well. We do know what uh, has happened in the United States in terms of production, and we do know how important the National Farm Organization is to that production. So for us to come into a foreign country, i.e. the United States, uh, and go into a crushing project with capital and technology does not do us a lot of good unless the production is here. So we are delighted to be part of this project, and I am personally very happy to be here to be able to touch a little bit on who Sasetru is, what goes on in Argentina, and how we can bring uh, some expertise to the project, which we will hope uh, will be attractive to the National Farm Organization. I'd like to touch on three or four major things, and I'll just briefly uh, outline those for you. I think to put the uh, Sasetru group in proper perspective, we ought to talk a little bit about Argentina. I would then like to discuss specifically Sasetru, what they do, who they are, where they were founded, what markets they're in. Third, uh, I think we'd like to talk about the, the Sunflower Crush project itself. Um, Moving briefly to Argentina, uh, you may know it's sort of the lowest country in the southern third of the South American continent. It is uh, 25 million in population, which is made up basically of Europeans. Uh, there are only about 2 percent of the population is, comes from Indians or native people. So it's basically European people who have transposed themselves to, to the south of Argentina. Uh, it is a very literate um, society. They are 95 percent uh, uh, literate. Um, the country is approximately 65 percent the size of the continental United States. 
It is a terribly rich country. There are great, I think, parallels between Argentina and the United States, at least in a century ago, uh, as far as the United States is concerned. Uh, they have tremendous agricultural uh, potential. They are one of the leading uh, export uh, grain and meat export countries of the world, uh, like the United States, like Canada, and like Australia. Uh, in addition to the tremendous ability to export uh, agro products and beef products and fish products and, and chicken products, uh, they are also self-sufficient in energy. Uh, and the, the uh, people in Argentina feel that with these two combinations, number one, self-sufficiency and energy on the one hand, and on the other hand, the ability to export tremendous amounts of foodstuffs, that it is a country of the future. I happen to feel that way, too, and that is one of the reasons why I am associated with an Argentine group at this particular stage. Um, moving to Sucetru itself, um, that is a strange name, and that is the first question I have. What does Sucetru mean? It is not an Indian name. It is simply the first two or three letters of the three founding uh, uh, partners, and those partners were together. Uh, at the Agricultural College at the University of Buenos Aires, uh, and they decided, after taking various courses, that they should form a company together to take advantage of uh, Argentina's tremendous agricultural potential, both from the standpoint of domestic production, but more particularly from the standpoint of its export potential. Um, and their orientation has been, since the late 40s, always, in the always on the export side. Uh, their first uh, line of exports was a dehydrated uh, line of vegetables, uh, but in 1970, uh, 1952 they bought a, a vegetable oil crushing plant, and that crushing plant was basically involved with sunflower, uh, crushing sunflowers. So they have had, almost from its inception, a deep involvement with the sunflower industry, both growing, crushing, and marketing. Um, as they went forward in time, it made some sense because of Argentina's uh, political situation, its weak currency, and the international uh, fluctuations in commodity prices worldwide to try to diversify their product line. And they have moved into, with affiliated companies, uh, beef pro processing and packaging, um, the milling of cereals, uh, baking of uh, flour-based products, uh, they raise chickens, they are exporting tremendous amounts of fish. Uh, they are in shipping, and they produce tremendous amounts of wine, and I will uh, talk about these more briefly in a few moments. At the same time, uh, they said it made some sense to diversify in Argentina out of the agro-industrial area, and they uh, moved into energy. They now uh, produce roughly about 10 percent of Argentina's crude oil production, and they will have a uranium mine, the first uranium mine coming on stream probably sometime in the second quarter. At the same time, because of the uh, political instability of Argentina, they thought it made some sense to diversify out of Argentina, and in 1972 began to build a network of commodity trading and crushing facilities in Europe. And today, through a group of companies known as Elisa Commodities, they are now operating in uh, approximately eight European countries. They have a big crushing uh, plant, both for sunflower and um, soya in Ant uh, Antwerp, and they have a fairly good-sized bank in Brussels. So they have diversified not only in Argentina outside of agricultural uh, production, but they've also diversified into the geographical uh, uh, region of Europe. Uh, just a brief few lines to give you uh, a br uh, an idea of how big they are and what kind of products they're in besides sunflower in Argentina. Let me just mention some of these uh, brief lines and activities. Cereal exports. In 1972, Sucetru began exporting cereals, and by 1977, one year after the termination of the government's monopoly in grain trading, it became the leading cereal exporter of Argentina, handling over 10 percent of the cereal exports. In 1978, they exported approximately $175 million of uh, grain exports, and this year they're running at $145 million <coughs> through three quarters, so they are going to have larger export next year. Um, in terms of vegetable oil processing, they have three plants in Argentina with a capacity to crush 2,000 tons uh, per day and an oil refining capacity of 500 tons per day. In terms of soil me uh, uh, soybean processing, they are finishing a plant that is going to be utilized exclusively for export, and that will export uh, approximately 600,000 uh, soybeans a week. 
uh, it will, I'm sorry, it will crush 600,000 tons of soybean, uh, uh, soybean for oil and meat for export, and that will come on stream sometime in April. Finally, they are very big in the, um, uh, the uh, meat packing industry. Uh, they have uh, facilities that process 20,000 head of cattle uh, a month. So you can see that they are a, a, a quite a large uh, agricultural uh, complex. Um, the, in terms of sales, the total group uh, uh, sold last year, 1978, over one billion dollars in total sales. So it's a large company. I think in terms of their importance to the country itself, they export 12 percent of the total uh, of the total export uh, capacity of the country. They are drilling between 10 and 12 percent of the country's energy requirements in terms of petroleum. Uh, they are also actively involved with finance. They have this, the third and the eighth largest banks in the country. They will be making some investments in this, in this country. I am the representative for all four of their banks in New York, and so I'm very close to that particular uh, area of activity also. The conclusion, therefore, is I think that the Cetru is not a small Latin American uh, commodities uh, trading or producing company. It is rather, I would suggest to you, a sophisticated international conglomerate that is looking for new markets and looking in those markets for good friends with whom they can cooperate. And there's no question in this sense that as far as the United States is concerned, it's certainly the I.S. Joseph Company and uh, the National Farm Organization. Um, I would mention just briefly some of their international activities outside of Argentina because I think that will lead us into uh, their activities in the United States. It was a natural evolution that they should move uh, out of Argentina into the international area because from the foundation of the company they were always involved with export products. So as I mentioned, they went to Europe about 1972 and started a lease of commodities. Why Europe? Europe first, mainly because Argentines are basically European oriented. They're, they're 55 percent Italian and about 30 percent Spanish. So their natural market is to Europe. Uh, Elisa Commodities today is a major commodity trading organization which uh, had uh, total sales last year of 600 million. It is estimated they will be 700 million this year, 700 to 750 million. So this is a large, large op uh, operation in Europe. In addition to that, they have a large cl crushing plant, as mentioned, in Antwerp, and they have a small, uh, medium-sized bank in, in Brussels. So they are well oriented towards Europe. I think two and a half years ago, when the European strategy became complete, they decided, really, let's look at the United States market, because the United States market should be more important to us. It's a larger market. It is in our hemisphere. Our natural inclination should be as a Western Hemisphere country to the north, to the United States. And about two years ago, a subsidiary was opened in New York called Pan American Food, which essentially imports frozen fish blocks and then forward sells those to the processing companies to, for consumer product lines. In addition to that, they've opened up the representative offices of four banks, the largest one being the Banco International, of which I'm the representative. Um, in terms of more asset diversification into the United States, because of the strength of the dollar versus their, de their, de their depreciating currency, they have looked for uh, opportunities to invest in uh, industrial or commercial activities directly. And the first project which we have looked at has been uh, through the introduction of the I.S. Joseph Company, this crushing plant, and we're very, very excited about it. Um, we are also in the process of uh, making an acquisition of a large fish processing plant so that we can take our frozen fish from Argentina and ship it into the United States and have our own uh, um, processing facilities for, con for a consumer line of, of, of fish products. Um, I should mention that in spite of all this diversification, uh, one of Cicetru's major love is sunflower. This is one of their first products they were involved in. They also have seen the tremendous growth in the world. They have seen what has gone on in the United States, and they are very interested in coming into the United States with this particular product, and are particularly interested in the Crush uh, uh, project. Uh, they've seen the, the, the growth in the United States, which has been spectacular over the last two and a half years, and they have maintained very close contact with the I.S. Joseph Company, who has also kept them involved of this growth and the potential for this market. So Cicetru is completely um, committed to this project. The project is uh, now evaluated at a $30 million uh, level. That's a lot of money. 
uh, Sucetru and the I.S. Joseph Company, because of their faith in the market and the product, uh, have decided to go forward on this thing on a fairly much of a joint venture basis, which I would think would be very important to the National Farm Organization and their relationship with the I.S. Joseph, uh, Joseph Company. That means to say that as I.S. Joseph feels as strongly about this project as it does to come in and take uh, roughly 50 percent of the equity or arrange for the equity to be, to be put up. We will be putting up the other uh, 50 percent of the equity, but more important than that, uh, we hope to bring to the project uh, some technology. Most sunflower oil is crushed by taking the entire seed and crushing the seed with the hull and the meat, which produces an oil which has fiber and does not have as high a protein content to it. The Argentines have uh, perfected a, and have used this system for 12 to 15 years of decorticizing the seed. That's to say that they break the seed, they crack the seed, and they separate the hulls from the meat. And the meat is then only pressed, which produces, as you can imagine, a much purer oil with less fiber and with a much higher protein content. Um, many people uh, have thought about doing that process. There are some smaller uh, scale plants on stream that use this process. The major difficulty with the process, and particularly with a plant of the size that we're talking, which will be 1,000 tons per day, is what do you do with all these hulls? It's okay for a couple of weeks and a couple of months, but then you start building up these tremendous mountains of hulls. The Argentines have solved this problem by using the hulls as a source of fuel. And they have designed and have utilized in Argentina a high-pressure boiler that effectively creates steam that generates electricity, that can be used to generate electricity. Uh, and this is the technology that we hope to bring to this particular project, in addition to our capital. That's to say that with, uh, and this is being discussed today in Minneapolis, with these high-pressure boilers using the, the hulls for fuel, our, the, the Argentine Sucetra Group has determined that there is a one to four relationship between the weight of hulls and the weight of, of, uh, of petroleum. So in other words, you can equivocate. You can have the equal amount of petroleum through four times the amount of hulls. And this project will produce enough hulls through the decorticizing, uh, decorticizing process to produce the energy to run the plant. And the thing that fascinates me, being a banker and, and not a farmer, unfortunately, and not a technician, is that sunflowers, the sunflower product is a product that produces a oil that, number one, has the highest protein content, but on the other side of the coin is also self-sufficient or nearly self-sufficient in its own energy. And I think that is a very significant point, and that is one of the reasons why we are so happy to be part of this project and to be uh, joining with you, the National Farm Organization, with our good friends at I.S. Joseph Company. Thank you very much. I was just thinking, things changed over a year. Last year, I didn't have these. Now I've got to live with them, you know, glasses. And it isn't because I've got bad eyes. It's because I've got an old birth certificate. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what the optometrist told me. All right, uh, we have seen uh, what we've done today in our uh, uh, sunflower program. I summarized that for you earlier today, that already to date we have shipped 68 thousand metric tons and it's still coming in. Uh, it's going to be a big year for us. We have to have it bigger if we're going to have several markets develop. Uh, that being, and we see what the markets are, we intend to continue our world markets that we've developed over the years where our product is asked for by name. We also intend to develop our own domestic market and it's with that attitude uh, that we started out on the crushed plant project to begin with. And of course, our thinking being uh, uh, that if we own part of the plant, it would very definitely be ours. You know, well, we discussed today we can't have it as ours uh, as members, uh, individual members, because of SEC. So we have to go to the next best one and uh, trust that operation and that financing to uh, two people that we feel that history is proving work with, uh, not necessarily say Sutro, but very definitely I.S. Joseph. And it was on the strength of I.S. Joseph's recommendation that uh, we first considered say Sutro, because this isn't a, a one-sided uh, situation one way or the other. It's both of us standing off looking at the other. And each one of us wants to know the other one better. And that's why in just a few moments, 
Uh, you're going to have an opportunity to talk to Al and Marsha and uh, most especially uh, Jonathan or uh, Dana here to get better acquainted. I would uh, really prefer that you talk to Dana and Jonathan and Al. Uh, I'll take care of Marsha. I think she's got a knife. <laughs> I'm just trying to protect you. So uh, that puts us back in our role, really, uh, where we should be. It, it bothered me to one extent that uh, uh, we get into a crush plant project, but on the other hand, I want to make sure it was ours. And our job really is production and the marketing of it. And I think that we know how to do that. We've proved it with our Sunflower pro program in the past. And so now we've got the ability or the possibility of entering into a, a situation that will be having our cake and eating it too, quite frankly. We won't have to put up the money, but we'll still get a lot of the benefits. Well, one of the most important ones, and Jonathan uh, alluded to it, is the fact that it's energy self-supporting. We've got a lot of crush plants in the United States today that use either coal, oil, or natural gas, and they can't be converted cheaply. And as those fuels go up in cost, it all automatically means that they've got to get more out of the crush to pay for their cost of fuel and that, which, where we have our own fuel, means that we're going to be more competitive. You know what I mean? Doesn't it sound like a farm project? Highly efficient. We produce our own fuel. That's what we're talking about, the gas haul and all the other things. So here we are on the ground floor. Now, to give you an idea of size and everything, I couldn't help but hear uh, the billion-dollar figure. That impressed me. But let's put it in relationship to the National Farmers Organization. I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but we're just under the $1 billion gross figure ourselves uh, by just a few dollars, and our goal for next year is something like 2.5, if I remember right. They may have given it one of the other meetings, and I said in the staff meetings, and he was asleep, but it seems like I've heard about 2.5 is going to be our goal in gross sales next year. So that gives you an idea that the Sutro and uh, uh, National Farmers Organization are about the same size and, uh, I might add, complexity, because we're in uh, basically the same products that they are. Uh, I was a little apprehensive, though, when he was talking about uh, bringing in food until I found out it was fish. I thought, well, I got through that one all right, you know. <laughs> I don't know what I'd have done if you'd said beef, uh, Jonathan. <laughs> You know, you never anticipate everything, and uh, but that shows you that we're perfectly above board and honest with this. I was sitting here making notes, and I said, now what the hell do I do? <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, really, I, I thought, well, I might have a real problem here. So our job is to sign up, and we're already doing that. We told you that we've got uh, better than 60,000 acres signed up, but we've got to have more. If we're going to supply our people in Europe and supply our own new domestic market, we're going to have to have the flowers, aren't we? Now, I told you a little minute, uh, a minute ago in the other room uh, that we would have 100,000 acres today if those phone commitments that we already have, you know, we have a new program where we get on the phone and we call you up and say, now, look, uh, I'd like to know how things are going and uh, are you getting your checks all right? Is the deliveries okay? You got your bill of lading, so forth and so on. And how about next year's crop? Let's sign it up at the same time. When we sign it up over the phone, send it for you to sign. It's one, efficient, and two, uh, it's faster, but it does not save any money. Isn't that amazing? You'd think that a phone call would be cheaper than a gallon of gasoline. Well, Ma Bell took care of that one, but the thing is, is time. That's, we gain it there. Now, I was amazed when we started into this project. I thought, man, I'm going to make this budget balance once and for all because a telephone call certainly had to be cheaper than gasoline. And I forgot one thing, that apparently the reps that we have working for us were uh, those first teenagers that had their own phone because our phone bill is atrocious. Either that or you guys like to talk, and I've never been able to pin down which. And if it's both, well, you know what the situation is, but the, we still make her. The proof of the pudding is the sign-ups and having it, and then being able to go out and see those new people that we haven't seen yet. We, the time is so important to us because we can go out now and see them rather than having to see you people that are going to already be in the project. You see what I'm saying? Uh, in the Sunflower program. So that pretty well wraps it up. Uh, and can you think of a better combination than uh, developing our own domestic market like we've developed our own foreign market? And we have done that. And people will tell you that our flowers are asked for by name. Well, look at now Italy. They, uh, uh, they like ours. And uh, uh, to show you how uh, we go in our international, I don't know if you know that or not, but my son uh, could become an Italian citizen if he wanted to. Uh, he was born in Italy, uh, I can't remember, I knew someone asked him when, I don't, don't remember, it was a long time ago. 
you know. Uh, really, uh, the reason I don't know is my wife had him and I didn't. And, and, uh, and I wasn't there even. Yeah, that's a fact. She had him uh, uh, in Livorno, which we know as Leghorn, and I was up in the hills uh, uh, fighting the war after we'd already won it, you know. Uh, that's a fact. I was there in 1955 and 6, so it was in uh, 56 when he was born. I guess I can figure that out. But anyway, he can become an Italian citizen. Well, now we're dealing with Italians. I suppose that to keep this thing kind of international, I'll have him apply for his Italian birth certificate and citizenship. Uh, and sometimes I wished he would and go back to the home country. <laughs> uh, be that as it may, uh, and it sounds like I got a bad family. If you think I talk bad about him, you hear what they say about me. <laughs> I'm going to turn it open now for questions and answers, and I promise this gentleman right back here that he could ask a question, and we'd try to give him an answer. So that gives you the idea. We've got contracts for sale around. I want you to sign up if you haven't, and I'm curious to know something. How many of you have your 1980 crop signed up in here? I want to see the hand. Well, how about that? That's good. All right. Because I know the crowd fairly well, and I'd like to have the hands raised of those of you that don't raise sunflowers, because I know there's a few in here. Well, isn't it amazing? It's just the other, the other group. Did you, uh, you see that? I got a, almost 100% sign up in here. Yeah, I'll, I'll bet there's only one or two, and I'm going to see you later. Uh, you know. Now, how about 1981 and 82 and 83? Let's see some hands. Yeah, there are a few here. You see, we're starting into a new era where we're building depth into this, and you see why? Because if we're going to supply crushed plants of our uh, own making, and if we're going to supply our foreign market, and we're going to be in farming for a few more years, we just will get with it, hadn't we? Well, we've got the documents around. Make sure that you take that rep down, and, and you have to find him for the documents usually, and sign up your production for 1981, 82, and 3, because we've got it already. Did you know that? And I goofed. I should have brought you the figures for those years, because it's rather impressive already, uh, the acres we have. It isn't obviously as much as the 60,000 or 62,000 we have right now for 1980, but it's coming along. Okay, we're now open for questions and answers. So I'm going to let you ask a question. I cut you off. You see how we handle things in here? Now you want to ask that question? Where is that fellow? Did he leave? He got mad and left. Well, uh, he must have known I couldn't answer his question anyway. Now, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask? Uh, I'll start here, and I'll try to get everybody. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm, uh, the question was, in case you couldn't hear it, how would us as Sun Farm uh, members and pr uh, producers, uh, NFO members and producers, how would the Sun Farm uh, Futures help us? Well, I hope I answer the same way I did to CFTC. It won't. <laughs> and we're the only people who have protested the futures contract. And if it weren't for our protest, you would probably have a futures contract in Sunflower's right today because the process goes this way, that they put out a notice that they're going to have a futures contract in a commodity, this time being Sunflower's, and if there is no prote protest to it, then they don't have to have hearings because of one protest. Incidentally, there was only one supporting it also, and that was the North Dakota Grain Dealers Association, Elevators Association, excuse me, uh, was the one for it. We were against it. Uh, if we hadn't have done that, it would have been in, and now there has to be hearings. And it's my understanding, I don't see him back here, but Mr. Stone from CFTC, is he there? Yes, he is right back here, has come to visit and get acquainted with us. He's uh, very conscientious. He is the, um, i, I got to use the right title, he's the head of CFTC. Uh, what was, what's that title? Chairman. chairman, all right. He's the chairman of CFTC from Washington, D.C. He's... Uh, uh, very serious about this job. I've had good reports about him. We're going to get together a little bit later and, and talk with him and discuss our views on why we're opposed to Sunflower Futures contract. I'm, uh, I think you all know why. I think we've said it so many times that we don't have to repeat it, but that's where we stand on that issue. Uh, you, I think you were next. All right. Uh, you want to handle that one, Dana, or Jonathan? All right, uh, I'll try to repeat them so you do hear them. The question was, where is this plant going to be? I paraphrase it, but that's about what he said, wasn't it? 
The, uh, we currently have uh, options on three different locations. I'm not at liberty to disclose them, but uh, it'll generally be in the uh, eastern North Dakota, uh, northwestern Minnesota area, if that is of some help to you. Okay. Yes, you may. Uh, it, it might also be of interest uh, to you all that because there's been a lot of talk about different plants going on stream and so forth. The groundbreaking date at this moment is the 1st of April, and it is thought that the project will take uh, approximately 21 to 24 months. It will then take another six months for the uh, production to get from startup to full capacity. So we're talking maybe 30, 32, 34 months to full capacity. That's a thousand tons a day. Incidentally, the site selection, uh, we had direct input into that as to our productivity areas, our, our strengths and weaknesses as far as areas, and that is going in and being weighed uh, against site selection also. Yes, sir. Well, uh, may, I, uh, may I answer that one, uh, Dana, because I've been involved a little bit. Uh, you may not be aware of it, but we've been to Carrington, and I was involved going up there personally, and uh, we have taken each site, and there is better than about 42 criteria that we go through. So it's a very serious business. Site selection has been going on now for approximately nine months, believe it or not. And uh, one other thing that I can assure you of, I doubt uh, very seriously whether we will be in Cargill's backyard. Uh, uh, I don't think you have to worry about that one. Uh, well, seriously, you know. Sure. Yeah, we don't think it is either, and that's the reports we've had, and the same with some of the other projects. Yes, sir. Yes, the plant does become self-sufficient for power needs especially if you convert your steam to electricity. Now, it's decided not to, from the engineering aspects, to convert uh, the steam to electricity, then you do have to buy a portion of your power in the form of electricity. Uh, I know that there's, it's got long engineering ramifications to it, but basically, yes, you are self-sufficient. Yes, that's correct. All right, Edgar.
Yes, Edgar, you brought up a, a very good question, and I uh, told Al uh, that these are some of the things that needed to be discussed here today. Um, all right, let me uh, rephrase uh, Edgar's question, if I may, so that all of you can hear it. Uh, we came out sometime in the middle of the summer, I don't remember the exact date, with a letter saying that we had made arrangements with Great Lakes Stock and Storage where we have uh, additional dumping facilities, uh, in addition to that, uh, 16 hours a day, so forth and so on. As the year went on and everything, uh, things did not turn out the way we stated them in the letter, uh, quite uh, basically. And Edgar's question is, well, what are we going to do about that uh, for future, and what about our future deliveries now for spring and this winter yet? Uh, how are we going to handle that? Uh, we've been uh, discussing that seriously, and I want Al to answer it because we've had the direct input, and he wants to get involved with that. Uh, let me explain uh, one situation, and I know you'll all understand. You know we're putting on a film at uh, 5 o'clock, especially it is. Great Lakes. Great Lakes got spoiled this fall, and during the two-month strike, they took in wheat. They took in 60 trucks a day, and it spoiled. And the workers, and the basically the management lost control of the workers. We're right now in the process. Our contract expires in the end of December. We're right in the process now of negotiating with them for next year. The contract, obviously, we've learned this year. The contract wasn't binding that we had signed with them. It wasn't detailed enough. I have asked Shelley to list the problems that you witnessed, what has actually occurred at Great Lakes, list those, and we sit down with our negotiations here at, uh, after Christmas with Great Lakes, we'll have these documented problems right there in front of them. They'll be incorporated into a contract. I'll show Shelley a copy of the contract before we actually sign it. And uh, we can go one step farther. We can draft a letter from the contract that again would go out to the members. Yes. There is some problems with the facilities also. Uh, they last year had also promised us they'd have a truck dump in there this fall. They changed ownership basically with the company. The two of the owners died. The son that was to take over committed suicide. So <laughs> They're based out of Chicago, and they have not got their feet on the ground yet, really. It's, it was a combination of factors, but I guarantee you a contract will be worked out, and Shelley will see it before we actually sign it this year, because we need the facilities. 